It is Monday, November 6, 2017. My name is Ashton Ellett. I'm here in Marietta, Georgia with former Governor Roy Barnes uh, for another installment of the Two-Party Georgia Oral History Project sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Um, Governor Barnes is the founding partner of the Barnes Law Group here in Marietta, Georgia. Thank you very much, Governor, for Thank agreeing you. to sit down. Thank really you. do appreciate it. It's an honor to have you here. Thank um, you. It's an honor to be with you. I was wondering if we could begin. Uh, tell me a little bit about your childhood, your upbringing. Um, I was uh, raised here in Cobb County. Uh, my father, uh, my grandfather moved to Cobb County in 1919 from up in North Georgia. Gilmer County. Uh, my f f grandfather, my father, and my uncle all ran, were in the general merchandise business, and Daddy farmed. Of course, everybody farmed back then, but Daddy farmed. And, um, so, and I grew up in a general merchandise business. I often say I learned more about practicing law in that store than I did at law school. Did you, uh, you know, you talk about families that were that were very politically involved or plugged in. Did you come from one of those political families? I did. General stores uh, were a natural gathering place uh, during my time of growing up of where politicians came and talked. And uh, my Uncle Felton and my daddy were both, uh, never ran for office, but they were very politically active. And uh, so, you know, I had an early fascination of all these folks that would come by campaigning and talking and everything else. And it really sparked an interest in me at, at that, those uh, early years. Now, did, you, did your family, uh, were they Talmadge supporters or the no. anti-Talmadge crowd? They were Talmadge. In fact, my middle name is Eugene. Sure, sure. And uh, I was named after Eugene Talmadge. And uh, they were... Daddy said, my daddy said, the only time that my grandfather ever deviated from the Talmadges was uh, when Richard Russell, when her, uh, Jean Talmadge ran against Richard Russell, which was 36 or 38, I can't I believe 30, I think it was, I believe it 30. He ran against <laughs> Camp, Camp was one That'd of been, That would have been 38, and was then, George and Camp. And then so 36. 36. And um, Grandpa stayed with Richard Russell. He liked Richard Russell. But besides that, they were Talmadge folks. And Herman Talmadge, of course, Gene was dead by the time I was born, but because I was born in 1948 and Gene died in 1946. Uh, <clears throat> but Herman Talmadge, uh, every time I'd see him, he would remember me fondly. Uh, about my father, my grandfather, and my my uncle and my daddy. What do you think engendered sort of that very personal, almost familial, clannish nature of Georgia politics? That sort of friends and neighbors back. Yeah, it was. And remember this: uh, Gene Tamage came up in a very tumultuous time, thirties and forties, uh, but particularly the thirties, and. Uh, there was a lot of populism that sure, you see today sure. with Gene Tamage. He was, you know, three dollar tag. You know, I'm gonna, <laughs> every farmer says, "Well, I'm for him because he's gonna give me a three dollar tag." Not thinking that well, every trucking company was gonna get a three dollar tag. Georgia too. Power, Georgia Power, <laughs> and all of them. Uh, and he was very populist, uh, and he was wrong on race. There's no question sure. about it. But at the time, you know, uh, it was a whole different time. And the familial basis, remember that Georgia was a much smaller state then. And in fact, total votes cast, you know, would be 350 to 375, uh, mm -hmm. where we cast uh, in a good election over 2 million now. And so it was a very familial time, and there was a lot of family connections. Georgia was still predominantly agricultural and rural, uh, which by its very nature has family backgrounds and family connections. You were born in 1948. That's, mm -hmm. that's right in between the, the, the closure of, of Bell Bomber yes. and the opening of what was then Lockheed, Georgia. Yes. 
So you witnessed sort of the the real stupendous growth of Cobb County. I did. What was the county like? When your, your first memories of it to to when you were first elected to the to the legislature in '74. Well, you know, my daddy used to say that the county hadn't been the same since the Bummer Plant. They called it <laughs> the Bummer Plant came, and it was true. And after World War II, uh, of course, Bell Bummer closed, and then Korea, uh, it reopened and became Lockheed Georgia, and then later Lockheed Martin. Uh, in the 50s, you know, when I was growing up, uh, Cobb County was still primarily rural. It had begun to grow uh, because of Bell Bomber, and, but it was a county of 50,000, 50 to 60,000 in the 50s, and about a, a third to a half of that population was in the city of Marietta, and everything else was pretty well uh, <coughs> rural. But Lockheed dominated the county. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, uh, if Lockheed uh, sneezed, the rest of the county caught pneumonia. And uh, it was very dependent on it. Now, that began to change really in the 70s. Sure. And uh, that was true on up through the 60s. And then the next great spurt that Cobb had was starting really in the 60s. Uh, I think we, clo uh, we uh, went over 100,000 population in the 1960 census. And a lot of that was based on the white flight from Atlanta, <clears throat> the integration of the public schools, and most of it came to the south end of the county first, which is ironic, which is now the most diverse right, part of right. the county. And that's where I was from, down in Mableton. But it was still a largely a rural county. And Daddy, of course, we sow feed, seed, and fertilizer, and we're an international harvester dealer, and then later a Kubota dealer. And uh, so a lot of the things that growing up was really about farming, you know, one way or the other. Could you tell a, a, a class difference, a, a political difference between sort of the Marietta crowd versus, say, West Cobb, South Cobb? It, it was, let me tell you, it was everything against Marietta. South Cobb didn't like Marietta because they controlled our politics. North Cobb didn't like Marietta because they controlled our politics. There was not a lot of population in East Cobb at the time, but there, uh, it, it was, Marietta was, the divide was, are you from Marietta or are you somewhere else? Now, I first ran for office in 74, and uh, Marie was a Dobbs, uh, which the Dobbs are one of the pioneer families in this county. Uh, she went to Marietta High School. I met her at the University of Georgia. But part of the great compromise of us getting married was that I lived, we lived in Mableton and we would go to church in Marietta. <laughs> so we went to the Methodist Church in Marietta, and my office was in Marietta, but I went to Mableton every night. And in fact, in my first few elections in the 70s, that was one of the, that helped me greatly uh, because uh, I, I took the south uh, part of the county just solid because I was one of the first ones to be elected from down there rather than from Marietta. So, sort of like a, a, a microcosm of Georgia politics writ large is, Atlanta. are you from Atlanta, Atlanta. or somewhere Absolutely. else? Absolutely. So tell me about your, your first forays into politics, your first political experiences, uh, even, even before your, your, your run for office. Well, I went to the University of Georgia in the fall of 1966, and Lester Maddox, uh, was in the process of getting elected. Uh, and I, Lester Maddox never was my cup of tea. Uh, and I became a young Republican uh, at the University of Georgia. I think I held some office there. I don't remember, it's been so long ago. But I do remember I was, first, uh, was a young Republican. I often uh, told folks that uh, Lester Maddox made me a Republican and Richard Nixon made me a Democrat. <laughs> but, um, it, it, you know, I was active uh, in, there uh, in the University of Georgia. I had, to show you how sheltered 
I was. Uh, I was raised here in Cobb County, never lived anywhere else. But I had never been to Athens, Georgia before I went uh, to college down there, 65 miles away. My father had a seventh grade education. My mother was a, was not, did not have a high school education. Daddy had a, was a great businessman and Mama was a fine woman, but I was the first one to go off to college. And, uh, and it, to be quite frank with you, Daddy questioned me about it. He said, you've got a good business here and all mm. this other stuff. And I told him I wanted to, I was thinking about going to law school. And uh, he said, well, I'll pay for you to go to law school. Of course, the quarterly tuition back then was $85 a quarter. And when you went to law school, it was hundred and fifteen dollars. It's gone up. Yeah, I, I know it has dramatically. <laughs> but I was active uh, on the, uh, you know, in the university, I, and I remember Blue Key and all the other things, uh, gridiron and everything else that you would think. Uh, I finished undergraduate school in three years, and uh, then started law school in the fall of '69. I was president of the student bar uh, in law school and was active in, you know, campus politics and all that. But, and then when I came back, I came to work for the uh, Cobb County District Attorney's Office in 72. But I had a military commitment. We all had military commitments back then. And I had gone through ROTC and mm -hmm. received a commission. Uh, and I was waiting orders and I went to work for the District Attorney's Office and I went to Officers Basic in early of uh, 1973 thinking that I'd be gone to Vietnam and all. But in the summer of 73, uh, the Nixon administration decided to wind the war down, and they put me in a reserve, put all of us in a reserve unit and sent us home after officers basic. And, and that was in 73, and the next year I ran for the legislature. Uh, I was 26. What compelled a, a 26 or beginning of your, your professional career, uh, or was that just something that, that you had always wanted to do? I, I'd, by the time I had gone to college, uh, and definitely by the time I was in law school, I knew I wanted to run for political office. And um, so it was just the natural next step. Now, I did not think that I was going to stay in it as long as I did, but you know, I wanted to go to the General Assembly, and I wanted to uh, do several things. Uh, I thought at the time I wanted to be uh, on the Georgia Supreme Court, and I knew that the best way to do that was going to, to uh, the General Assembly. Maybe one of your friends get elected governor, and he appoints you to the Supreme Court. Uh, but I grew from that. And in fact, Governor, I was Governor Harris's floor leader uh, in the 1980s, and um, he offered me an appointment at the Supreme Court, and I said, Oof, let me think about it. And I went by to see him the next day, and I said, uh, I'm not going to take it. He said, I know you weren't, but he said, I was <laughs> going to offer it to you anyway. I said, I'm going to run for governor, and he said, you should. And so that then, of course, I ran in 90 and was defeated, ran third in the race behind uh, Zell Mellon and Andy Young and me. And then in, uh, one of my great friends had been elected to my Senate seat, and then they created a new seat in the House in uh, 1992, and I ran then, 91 and 92, and I ran and went to the House for six years. What was it like as a 26-year-old? Um, you're in the State Senate. Um, this is back at a time when I think there are five or six Republicans in the entire uh, chamber. Mm -hmm. you know, what, what was your experience navigating the State Senate? Well... The state senate is much more, it was at the time, more, much more collegial than the House was, and less partisan. Uh, Bob Bell, Paul Coverdale, others like that, Jim Tysinger, mm -hmm. I mean, they were all my friends, and uh, the Republicans. Um, and in fact, uh, the younger members, which they were just a handful, uh, really voted together a lot across party lines because the division was not Republican-Democrat, it was old versus new. And that's what, you know, kind of brought us all together. 
And uh, Paul Coverdale uh, ended up being one of my best friends. And uh, in fact, I gave a eulogy at his funeral. And uh, Jim Tysinger was one, sat right behind me, was one of the greatest friends I had. And uh, it, it, it was a lot different. But for example, uh, you know, Culver Kid, who was, was a legend in the General Assembly, Culver called me a page for two or three years. You know, I'd, <laughs> I'd walk by his desk, and of course I was young and had a full head of bushy hair at the time, and he'd say, hey, Paige, go get me some coffee, you know. So <laughs> I ended up being friends with Culver, and that's kind of the way it is in the Senate. There's 56, and it's, it's like a medium-sized Kiwanis or Rotary Club. You know everybody. You know their family. You know everything about them. Where over in the house with 180 members, you can kind of get lost in there. And the coalition that existed and really existed uh, till 2002 was rural whites and uh, urban blacks. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, it was a great combination. Uh, but then, of course, that broke down. And right. it, 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 it had started to break down. I am shocked it lasted as long as it did, but it was a great coalition. Just, just to skip ahead, I, I, I wanted to ask you about that. Can that, you know, Alec Lamus, a famous political scientist, he called it the night and day coalition. He took that, that quote from Bob Shaw, the old oh, yeah. Republican chair. I, I know Bob, and I'm very fond of Bob. He's one of the greatest voices I've ever heard. Uh, that's right, the, the, the Homeland, Homeland Harmony Quartet. I, I love, uh, Bob and I have been friends for years and years, which, you know, I'm a Democrat, he's a very staunch Republican. You would never think that in modern times, but I would count Bob Shaw as one of my best friends. Now, what, what, what Bob called it was the Night and Day Coalition, and, and like you said, it was always a very fraught coalition. The coalition might even be a, a strong term yeah. for it. Um, can it ever be rebuilt in today's politics? That's a good question. I mean, there's no question that uh, we need a new coalition. I knew, I saw uh, that, but to use Bob Charles' term, the night and day coalition was, fra uh, was frazzling, uh, particularly among rural whites. Um, and the other thing, too, and this is one of the things Republicans are going to have to address, uh, the white Democrats were dying. They were older and they were losing population, as that has continued mm -hmm. today. And the new coalition that I was trying to build while I was governor was uh, suburban, white, particularly women. And so we targeted issues of education, green space, environment, all of these things that appeal to those type of voters. But I was just a little ahead of the time. Now that has begun to happen. Sure. And you look at Gwinnett County and Cobb County, who would have ever thought those two counties would have gone uh, for a Democrat like Hillary Clinton, for example. Of, of all people. Of all people. And they did. Now, it's two steps forward. It's like the Republicans when they came. It's two steps forward and one step back. I wish, uh, I think the worst coalition that we could have uh, is that we end up with rural whites uh, being all Republican. And, and I think that's very dangerous. Um, I, I would wish that Republicans could appeal more to African Americans and Democrats could appeal more to, to older white voters. Because th that gives us that sense of unity, and, but it's not turned out that way. Well, th this is skipping ahead uh, somewhat in, in my, my line of questioning, but you, you mentioned Gwinnett County, you mentioned Cobb County, you know, the, the, the seventh congressional district, Rob Woodall seat, the sixth congressional district. Uh, that 6th Congressional District race, that special election, John Ossoff, somebody who came out of nowhere. I never heard of him before he came into my office. You, you me, and everyone <laughs> everyone else. It was his, his, his performance, 48.1% in, in the, the, the special and the runoff. For a Democrat to find 48% of the votes in the 6th Congressional District, is that purely a reaction to 
Donald Trump's surprise election in 2016, or is that indicative of, of, of longer, deeper structural changes I in, believe in sort of metro? I believe that it is uh, the result primarily of longer, deeper structural changes. Uh, here's what's happening. <laughs> this, this is just the opposite of what it used to be. College-educated women, for example, under 35 and under, are almost 100% Democrat, uh, single, if they're single. And what we're finding is more and more the higher education are being drawn to the Democrats. Now, rather, and it, that was not the way it was, it was that they were being drawn to the Republicans right. during right. my time. And so <clears throat> it's almost a, a swap. Uh, of the way that it used to be. But I don't think, here's, th there are several trends going. First is the trends toward uh, no party. Uh, sure. You look at the primaries, this is what's the problem with the primary. Nobody votes much in the primaries. And so you have the extremes on, in both parties that vote in the primary to elect those leaders. Uh, I'm almost to the point where you ought to have a Louisiana, a California, the, the so-called jungle primary. Jungle primary. Yeah. I mean, I'm almost there. I'm not, not quite there <laughs> yet, but I'm almost there. But the the, so you have that going on. You have a breakdown of the parties, and then you have more and more uh, social issues do not appeal to younger voters as they do to older voters. They think. Younger voters think we're crazy to argue about these social issues, that they are so personal that they should be left uh, to an individual, which is almost a libertarian kind of view, which has always been much. Tended, be, tended to be Republican. So there's a lot of ironies there. And then you add on top of that a growing nonpartisan, increasing education status, uh, you have dislike of social issues determining races. And then add the final element on there is demographics change. Now, I will say this, everybody that says, oh, the demographics are gonna change this, that is not true. You can, the party identification will not uh, change because of demographics. It will change because of some of these other structural changes that are going on. Why, why do you think it is, because as you indicated, Cobb County, for example, a democratic county for for decades and decades following the Civil War. And then you have the emergence of, of a very potent Republican Party yes. here in Cobb. Uh, it's organization-wise, um, ballot-wise, 70-30, 75-25 yeah, in statewide elections going to Republicans. What fueled the rise of the Republican Party in a county like Cobb? Several things happened. Uh, one is the white flight. Uh, from the, the, the 50s fueling and the early 60s fueling, uh, I'd say from 57 to 67 or somewhere in there, was fueled by white flight. And then you had Barry Goldwater in the middle of that and you had Lyndon Johnson who pushed the Civil Rights Act and, and you had in 64 and then you had Barry Goldwater saying that, uh, you know, that's all states' rights, uh, that shouldn't it shouldn't be a national concern. So that was the initial kick. And then, better educated, just like I say, mm -hmm. things have gone, have switched. The better, better educated folks became Republicans, young folks became Republicans. And then in the 80s, Reagan was such a great communicator, uh, you know. And Reagan, though he uh, said he agreed on certain uh, you know, abortion and so, certain other uh, social uh, issues, he didn't make it the primary message. His was an economic message. And I think that's part of the problem of the Democrats is they, they need to get back to a good, strong economic message. But anyway, so what happened, you had stages of it, and they became very strong. Listen, I remember, I believe it was 84, 80 or 84, that well, in 1980, Cobb was so strong elected Mac Mattingly. Mac Mattingly against Herman Talmadge. But in 84, when Reagan was running for a re-election, uh, I believe 
Reagan took like 83% of my senatorial district. I mean, you know, it was just overwhelming. And they, they, they were younger, they were uh, more energetic mm -hmm. and better organized. And remember the old Democratic Party, at that time they were older office holders and new folks coming in says, we don't want those old folks, we <laughs> want some of our newer, younger folks. Now, that peaked, uh, I started seeing it peaking uh, really in the late 90s. In 98, my recollection is uh, a Republican candidate did not take 40% against me in the election, um, uh, Guy Milner. Mm -hmm. If it was, it was very close. It was not a 70-30. 80-20. <laughs> right. In fact, my goal always when I was running statewide was uh, to uh, hold the Democrat, I mean hold the Republican to a 55 to 60 percent in Cobb County. And uh, I, I did that, but I didn't do that in places like Cherokee where I'd get 25 percent of the vote, or Gwinnett, I, I ran better in Gwinnett. But I started seeing that trend in my own races, uh, and it culminated. Uh, you know, we elected a, we'd elect a Democratic member of the county commission from that Southwest County, and then we've elected an African American right. member of that commission, and then you see the rest of the county, even in East Cobb. I mean, uh, Hillary Clinton did well, uh, and everything else. Uh, and if you'd had the same turnout among the folks in the sixth race, in other words, you just had a surge of Republican, if it had been a normal, uh, like it was, uh, Ossoff would have run. But that district, I never thought he had a chance in that district anyway. I thought that district was specially drawn for Tom Price. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but there's a lot of things that, you know, changed over the years and now, you know, it's, it's somewhat humorous to me. To, I see now the Republicans, and my local Republicans, oh, I've done a good job. I said, you certainly have. I said, but you know, I was here when it all changed from Democrat to Republican. And there were a lot of Democrats who were doing great jobs, and it didn't matter. And it's not going to matter with you. <laughs> why? That gets me to the question. Why were Georgia Democrats that night and day coalition able to hold on so long? I have some theories on that. One is that Jimmy Carter was from Georgia. And so in the late 70s, when uh, North Carolina and other states were changing, mm -hmm. Carter here helped us with him running for president and being from here. And he took, remember, rem he, he won Georgia in 76, he went less mountain 80. Uh, Bill Clinton took it in 92 and lost it by a very small vote in 96. Mm -hmm. So uh, it held on longer because of Carter, number one. Number two is um, you had folks like Tom Murphy, who you couldn't claim to be an Atlanta guy. He could go to no. South Georgia, <laughs> he could go to North Georgia and say, oh Tom, he's, I may not like him, but he ain't one of them. And so, I mean, you had folks like that that held, that had stability. Murphy was there for a long time. Zell was there for a long time, 16 years as lieutenant governor before he became governor. And it held, it held that coalition. It really started to crack uh, in the early 90s. By 94, you elected state, first statewide Republican, and really by 2002, they were all uh, Republicans, but that that will begin to change. Too. How, how much credit do 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 two of the governors you didn't mention, um, George Busby and, and Joe Frank Harris, who you did mention earlier? Nobody could accuse George Busby and no. Joe Frank Harris of being wild-eyed liberals no, or anything they like could not. that. And, and that was I do, I think that that was another reason. You take. <clears throat> uh, Busby started appointing the first African Americans and a pretty good man. Joe Frank Harris uh, made uh, Martin Luther King's birthday a uh, state holiday. So you see, they all of that, that was that balance. Mm -hmm. You know, you tell me what's most important. King's birthday is most important. Okay, we, we deliver on that. He delivered those rural voters. 
rural legislators on that. And so that coalition or coalition gives and takes. Mm, I mean, you right. know, it goes back and forth. And uh, so I think they were very important. I think that Busby, um, I think Carter being president, uh, Busby, Joe Frank, Zell. Sam Nunn. Sam Nunn, absolutely. The, the, those gentlemen you, you named, they were, they were always very keen to refer to themselves as Georgia Democrats yeah. as opposed to the National Democratic Party. Does it, is Doesn't there a matter dis- today. There is no distinction no anymore. No distinction. All politics have been nationalized. Uh, you, you can't make that distinction. People don't know. Uh, you know, older white rural voters, they understood that distinction. Uh, but th- that's way gone. I mean, you know, uh, you're either a Democrat or you're a Republican. And, you know, there's things about both of them I don't like, uh, to be quite frank with you. But uh, on the balance of things, I'm a Democrat, and I'm going to say one. Well, you were talking about organization and being energized, that Republicans were better organized, better energized. What was your, you were an elected Democrat for, for years and years. What was your assessment of the actual Democratic Party as an organization over there, you know, some suite of offices or office in Atlanta? Useless. Uh, I, the Democrats didn't have to organize for so long, and they didn't know how. And in fact, the ones, the organizations that existed with good Democrats the, were the ones that candidates like me and younger Democrats that started running. And so, uh, you know, uh, we used to do, uh, I thought the greatest invention that was in the 80s is when they started having a big electronic tapes of voters and you could program it to give me people that had voted in the Democrat primary, Mm -hmm. Republican primary, and who had voted uh, eight out of the last 10 elections, six out of the last, so I could target. That's right. And I thought it was the greatest thing that ever existed. It was completely foreign when I would talk to to my friends down in the General Assembly, but I had a very Republican district. Uh, at the time. I mean, my district was very Republican. It was the most Republican district held by Democrats. So, you know, and and my, uh, you know, literature, you could reprint it every year. It was, it was three things. <laughs> never voted for a tax increase. Number two, never took any expense of money. Uh, number three, never voted to increase his own pay. That was it. And it was a pretty conservative, and I never did vote for a tax increase. And I never sent a tax bill to the General Assembly. It's one of the things that I think the Democrats have allowed uh, Republicans to take away, away from. They're going through a tax bill in Washington right now that they increased the deficit of a trillion and a half, and the only balanced budget that we've had in the last 60 years came from a Democrat. A, a, a trillion and a half before markup, which before, starts today. Before markup, correct. <laughs> just, just so we get that on the record. So you were, you were saying basic, basically, if a candidate created an organization or used things like targeting, you know, thinking like an operative, it was out of self-preservation. Absolutely. Which the state Democratic Party never did. Didn't really have to do. It was really the first change in the state Democratic Party that was started putting it on a uh, some type of being a force was after Joe Frank got elected, uh, and there was a fellow named Paul Weston there for a while, but Bobby Kahn, Bobby became executive, executive director. director of the Democratic Party, and Burt Lance was chairman. And Bo- and then we had the Democratic Convention here in 1988. Mm-hmm. And Bobby, he, of course, Bobby's one of my best friends, was my chief of staff, and was my campaign manager, but Bobby knew how to target. And he and I got to talking I mean, that, we got to know each other during Joe Frank's election, and uh, I was governor's floor leader, and of course he was always dealing with the party, and we got to talking about how you target, how you find. That was the first beginning of that. Uh, and it improved, and then after I got beat, it stumbled. And they're coming back now rebuilding. 
the Democratic Party of Georgia, uh, with the breakdown of the the, the black white coalition, you know, what are what are the divisions within the Democratic Party here in the state? Well, you you know you have the normal divisions. Uh, you know you have. Uh, LGBT and gay, you have, you know, black and white and now Hispanic. Uh, and those are based on ethnic differences. Uh, and then you have the elected officials. And a lot of times elected officials are contrary to, to things that are happening in the party because they don't see how it's benefiting them directly. Elected officials are candidates because they don't see how it's benefiting them. The truth of the matter is, a party is only as good as its candidates. Uh, they can, the, there's no big money with parties, whether it be Democrat or Republican, unless it's really raised by the candidates and put in there. There's no magic wand, <laughs> you know, that they no no uh, pixie dust that anybody can come out there and says, you, you know, here put the, some of this pixie dust on and you're going to be elected. Uh, what a Democratic Party is, is the whole of the candidates, and they have to bring organization there, and then the Democratic Party can say, well, let me tell you, this is what we have available on our basis, and to intermarry those types of organizations. And that, that in the last few years, you know, like I, after I left, uh, there was, you know, was a, and got beat, there was a, you know, a, a, it was tough times, and, uh, uh, but they're growing back into that. Tell me about your, your assessment or, or how you have viewed the Republican Party of Georgia, how it has changed um, as a party in terms of personalities, yeah. priorities, well, things like that in your career. You know, um, the Republican Party in the 50s and 60s was generally a country club party. Uh, but they were well educated, a lot of doctors and sure, lawyers, sure. professional folks were there. Uh, and then there were some pockets up in North Georgia that were what I call Lincoln Republicans. Mm -hmm. Up in the mountains. Yeah, David Ralston's family. That's right. David Ralston's family, uh, Willard was, uh, was David's uh, father and he was clerk of Superior Court in Gilmer County. And he was an old time Republican. And <clears throat> so you had that. But then, and then they, you had this influx of new, younger, educated uh, folks that were not hung up on social issues. But what has happened in the last 25 years, social issues have taken over the Democrat, uh, the Republican Party. And so social, and, and it's had an effect on Democrats. And one of my criticisms of Democrats is you should have an economic issue, not an identity uh, politics. So, you know, you've got to have an economic, high, economic ed, and education. Economic is directly tied to education. Sure, so sure, that's, sure. that's, you have to make that connection and quality of life rather than saying, well, I'm here to protect a certain group. Well, Republicans have become more exclusive uh, in the last few years, and you know this idea that, well, if you even talk to a Democrat, you are a rhino, a Republican in name also. Let me tell you something. Johnny Isaacson is one of my best friends. Uh, Paul Coverdale and I had breakfast one Saturday a month for over 20 years. And he was at the governor's mansion having breakfast with me the week before he had a stroke and died. That is just unheard of now. And that is the great danger of the body politic uh, in this state and, of course, in the nation also. But so the way I view the Republican Party is uh, they have become the bastion of, uh, of some pretty extreme views. Now, <laughs> Everybody's, you know, some of my good Republican friends and uh, that are very bright, they say, well, Trump was an anomaly. I said, no, Trump is the Republican Party today. Uh, and it is true. And because you take a poll uh, in Georgia, you know, 70 to 80 percent of the Republicans say they approve everything he's doing. It's difficult for me to believe, but they do. And I... I think that's not good for the Republican Party. I don't think it's good for the state of Georgia. On the other hand, 
the Democrats have not given an, an adequate alternative message, and they've, indo they've uh, involved themselves in some identity politics that I don't think are good for the country. I heard on the radio this morning, um, NPR was uh, interviewing Eric Cantor, the yeah. former oh, um, I remember the whip. Eric. He got big, yeah. Um, and what he said was, was one that the the party, you know, that Donald Trump was an anomaly. That that he, his victory was because of Hillary Clinton and her unique flaws as a candidate, um, her baggage um, as being Hillary Clinton. And then they talked to another fellow, uh, who, who, who I forget who it was, but he's saying that Donald Trump, in his populist message. We're both historians here. If we can agree on a definition of populism, we, yeah, yeah. we should start a business. Yeah. Uh, what does Donald Trump mean to, one, the National Party um, and its future, its message, its priorities? And do you think that'll trickle down yes, to, do, the, to the state party? I do think it'll trickle down. You already see it in next year's governor's race. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the beginning that that Trump could uh, even, I, I can see a scenario where he's reelected. And that's number one. And number two is I think there's going to be some victories from his type of politics for a few years. Long term, I think it is deadly. Uh, I think it's toxic. And because as the population is educated more, becomes younger and more diverse, uh, there's going to be a backlash against it. Now, does that backlash occur next year, four years from now, or ten years from now? I can't tell you that. Uh, but just like there was a backlash against Democrats mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of their old and uh, beholden uh, tales, uh, that's true. going to be true uh, of, of the Republican Party. Listen. When I was a kid coming up, the Republicans, and you had Jacob Javits nationally, Nelson Rockefeller, right, and all right. these other folks, they were very progressive on issues of race. They were, by the way, the party of Lincoln. George Romney. George up Romney. In Michigan. Uh, and all of this. And so they have become, that is all gone. I mean, the Civil Rights Bill would not have passed if it hadn't been for Everett Dirks. Sure. And sure. so. Uh, that is all gone, and now, unfortunately, it's become the haven, uh, I hate to say this, a haven of people with extreme views. Now, not to say the Democrats don't have some of that also, but you know, one thing about, and you know, my election, you know, this is the stereotypes that people have. They, when I ran in 2010, they said, oh, you can, you know, all the pundits says, you got a, that's a black primary and you've got a black running against you and you won't be able to, to win. This and does you, sound familiar. Yeah. <laughs> 2018. I, yeah, I win. I, I won 63 or 64% of vote against all of them. Uh, I defeated uh, Thurbert Baker, who's a great candidate, great friend of mine. Absolutely. In his own home district, own home box. And so don't tell, that's the stereotypes, you know, that you have African Americans are much more used to voting for white candidates because they don't have the choice than white candidates, uh, white voters are for voting for African American candidates. And you know, I think that's bad. I think that we should, uh, you know, the hatred and vitriol uh, that I heard every day about Barack Obama was not a good sign for this country. Uh, we should, you know, we don't have to agree with everybody, but we do have to be civil. And we, it's not being politically correct, it's just being polite. Mm -hmm. And we have, particularly in the South, we have always been a polite people. So, I mean, there is so much, I mean, it's fascinating for historians. Uh, right now, but boy, it's unpredictable. ta Nahasi Coates, very, very, um, absolutely fantastic writer, great, great thinker. Um, he has a new book out, and he, he argues that a, a Donald Trump presidency would never have happened had Barack Obama not been elected president in 2008. I, that, there, I can see that theory, and I've read, I haven't read the book, but I've sure. read the review of it. 
And I do think it was a backlash. Uh, and not only was he an African-American president, he was a successful African-American uh, president, untouched by scandal. And that was the, that's what created the backlash. I mean, you know, if he had gotten into trouble or he'd done this or done that, you know, I, it may have washed over and said, I told you, you know. But he was not. He was successful and, and not uh, and untouched by scandal. And he was vilified. He was really vilified. And I, so I can see that the backlash, you know, the pendulum of history goes from one extreme to the other and stays in that moderate uh, space for only a short period mm -hmm. of time. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the Republican Party, the, the, the brand, the message, the, the platform, if there was a platform uh, of Donald Trump, uh, mainly uh, of an economic nationalism, uh, anti-immigration, rejection of globalization, uh, you know, a rejection of modernism in, in, a certain aspect, in a certain perspective, how can that be reconciled with the Republican Party's priorities from, from, from Nixon and Reagan, which is an embrace of free markets and free movement of people, uh, of, of immigration, of, of, of globalization? Can those it, be it reconciled? It can't be reconciled. I mean, it, it's been displaced. Uh, you know, I always thought that economic nationalism uh, should have been a democratic issue. Uh, what was for a very it was for sure. a very long time Bernie Sanders for Bernie example. Sanders and well going back to Franklin Roosevelt mm -hmm. and Harry Truman I mean and uh, it w was an economic uh, nationalism uh, and the Democrats allowed that just to be taken away from them uh, but you know the Republicans as you point out the free immigration this is going back to <laughs> hundred and fifty years ago. Republicans were always in fa favor of free immigration uh, because it brought them cheap labor. And so <clears throat> the reversal on those issues uh, I think is very troubling. And the problem that you have, particularly on the immigration issue, is that it, it reignites uh, stereotypes. Right. And uh, that's, not, that, that's simply not true. Uh, I find most of our recent immigrants to be some of the hardest working people I have ever met in my life. And uh, the other thing that, that bothers me too is how, you know, <laughs> Republicans had always counted themselves since really since Reagan as being the party of Christians. Uh, how can you reconcile that with, you know, throwing your neighbor across a wall, over a wall, or all of those issues that are like that, I, it's troubling for me. I, faith is a very important part of my life, though I don't stand up when I'm running for office and saying I'm the only Christian candidate, but I don't mind, I always, I, I proclaim, you know, that I am a Christian, I believe in the Christian ideals. I, I think that, and one of the, and to show you how this is affecting new folks, millennials and others, <clears throat> look at the drop off of people, of young folks going to church, joining Kiwanis or the Rotary Club, the Masons, anything else. They have come to the conclusion that all of that is hypocrisy. And that is what is going to hurt the Republican Party in the long term uh, is among those younger, better educated folks that say, you know, I'm, I'm tired of this hypocrisy that exists. Now how that turns out and when it comes, who knows. What, for, for example, if we, if we look at Georgia, what would you say the the priorities uh, of the Republican governing majority are here in Georgia, yeah. setting aside Washington. Yeah, I, um, I have better things to say about Republicans here, even though there's many I disagree with. But I think I honestly believe that Georgia Republicans, the one I the ones I know, are honestly in, interested in economic development. 
and they they understand how education feeds into that. Now I think they're off on a rabbit uh, <laughs> about some of these. You know, everything's got to be private. There's a place for private schools, and there's a place for. I was a big supporter of charter schools, but I do think they've got their priorities right. Where I question them some is there's not been a as strong a push on infrastructure as they should, particularly with mass transit. And part of that is my problem, my reason, uh, is that, you know, I was pushing a unified mass transit system, really from Athens to Macon to all the way to Chattanooga, <coughs> with uh, uh, Georgia Regional Transportation Authority and others. And then I got beat. And uh, I think that we had some governors that says, you see what Barnes does. What happened to Barnes when you get out there too much? Uh, it's best we just keep our mouth shut. And I think we lost some valuable time. Now they're beginning to wake up. Brandon Beach and others are talking about we have to have mass transit. They're right. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we have to have ways to break this bottleneck and, uh, you know, uh, even though they were against it, I was running the northern arc around the northern the arc, the northern the arc, outer go, perimeter, or outer perimeter to go all the way down to Macon, so we could take that truck traffic around and try to open up. But I was also pushing mass transit in those those suburban and exurban counties, and so I think I give I think Republicans, a Georgia Republicans, right now. I think they, they understand and they're beginning to learn how to govern. I think Nathan Deal, even though we ran against each other, we're still good friends. I think Nathan Deal's been a good governor. Sure. Uh, and uh, so that's a, they're not absolutely controlled by social issues. They've pretty well kept the abortion bills in the committee. They've let those dang gun bills out, but the governor is, has, uh, you know, uh, Watered them down. Watered them <laughs> down. Uh, they, he's kept, uh, they've kept the religious freedom cap on it. Um, I consider that to be much desired rather than where those are used on a national level right mm. now is divisive wedges. Since you brought it up, you know, we, can, we can get in the weeds for transportation for a little bit. When is Cobb County going to? Cobb County. Buy into MARTA. I think that Cobb County would uh, start, I think it was put up to a referendum and a regular vote that Cobb County would join uh, a, a, pu a public transit. Now, what I had planned was for Greta to eventually take over MARTA so that we could expand it without all these referendums. Oh, and sure. Going them. back to the 60s. Goes back to the yeah. 60s. Uh, and that uh, I'd ask in Greta for it to be able, for the General Assembly to give Greta the authority to levy a tax. They refused to do so, but I think you could have gotten that through. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, Marta's had some fits and starts and not some, t they've had great leadership on some and bad leadership on the other. And I think that if you did it and say, listen, this is going to be a state agency and we're going to put Controls and everything in. I think that I think that both Cobb and Gwinnett would join. You 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 brought up uh, when we were talking about your, your your early days in the in the state senate. You know, you named some Republicans: uh, Paul Coverdell, Bob Bell, Ty Singer. Yeah, that was part of what was called the Urban Caucus they back were. then, mm -hmm. and that was. Republicans and, and urban Republicans and Democrats often teamed up on transportation they issues did. against Absolutely. everybody else. Absolutely, they did, uh, and and it worked. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you think there is still the the anti-Atlanta, anti-Metro bias among some elected officials? Yes, I do. Now I think it's much less than it has been. I think there's a growing recognition. Uh, that the airport and the Atlanta metropolitan area uh, is, they're the econ economic engines of this state. Mm -hmm. And so, but there's still some Atlanta bias. I think the further you get in the exurbs, the more bias you get on, on that. Uh, and, uh, but with the rapid growth we have, I mean, you know, 
one of the things that was one of my big projects was I said we ought to run MARTA all the way to Cumming, Georgia, up the parallel to 400, because, because it was very popular there, mm -hmm. even among the North Fulton folks and all. And what I was trying to do was elevate the uh, mass transit over the interstates, you know, because so, we already had the right of way. I think that uh, something like that is accomplishable, even with some of the exurbs like Forsyth County, because I think they've seen it enough. I often, I, the reason I wanted to run it over the interstates is I told Catherine Ross this from Georgia Tech, uh, who was, uh, I appointed the first director in Greta, she's back at Georgia Tech as a professor. Uh, I said to Catherine, I said, the only way we get those folks riding up there is when they're sitting in traffic and they see a train go by very quickly. I said, they'll think, maybe that's the way I should get and start sitting in this traffic. I said, as l I said it has to be faster and more competitive. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, you know, so I think if you do that, you, I don't think this nut of mass transit is as hard to crack as we think it is. I, I think people are ready for it. Do you think it's going to take uh, a, a catalyzing event like losing a, an, an Amazon headquarters to someplace like Denver or Portland for, mm -hmm. to, to sort of rile up I the... Think an, I think a catalyzing event like that would speed it up, but what it's going to take is an activist government. <laughs> I mean, you know, Georgia is has a very strong government, and uh, nothing gets done unless the governor pushes it to be done. I mean, the status quo and kind of the inertia stands there until it absolutely, you have somebody that comes in and says, all right, this is my vision, we're going to do this. And he's got to be willing to fight it, and he's got to be willing even to get beaten. You know, the highway department, before it was Department of Transportation, yeah. one of the most powerful um, you know, agencies with, with uh, Jim Gillis. You, oh, yeah. you, you served with his son Hugh yeah. in the, yeah. in the Tom Senate. Tom Moreland. I mean, you know, uh, the, the, you know, that was very much a road-centric, asphalt-centric way of thinking. Is that still the case with, with, with DOT or, um, or, or just the thinking of average Georgians? It's still, uh, it's still there, but not as much, because really if you look what the Georgia D DOT is doing, it's mostly improving, expanding existing highways. There's not a lot of new construction, but we have such a large system. Georgia's the largest state east of Mississippi mm -hmm. uh, geographically, so it just takes a lot of money. And they have become, they, they have started to talk also and that's one of the reasons I think you have to have a governor that kind of integrates some of the road and the mass transit, like elevating it over, making stations at bridges, because the highway contractors and the highway department get to control, or the G mm -hmm. GDOT, they get to control that same process. Do you think the, even if this happens, and you have right down the middle is, is your heavy rail or light rail, You've got the roads. Is the political capital, the political will there to regulate development along the rights of way? Because that, that was always the, the major issue it was. with the, the Northern the, Arc, the opposition. Well, in the Northern Arc, you know, I was making a, the right of way a thousand feet, and I was going to reroute the railroads also, but I was making very limited access. I don't know. I think, uh, I think there is some limitation that, but you know, you could do that administratively well, with D Greta and Judah. So. Getting, getting back to politics, um, the Georgia Republicans, been in charge since you were defeated in 2002, um, had the legislature, Senate switched over after your election, mm -hmm. the House the next, uh, next cycle. We're at the point now where every statewide elected constitutional officer is a Republican. What is the greatest danger to the Republican Party's governing majority in this state? Um, it's the divisions among them. Uh, you have the business Republicans, you have the social Republicans, you have 
you know, just some special interests. I think that's the greatest problem that they have. Uh, I do believe that The truth of the matter is, a state that was pretty close would be the best thing that could happen here, because it would require working coalitions. We have a we have an election coming up. Uh, Nathan Deal's term limited. You've endorsed Stacy Evans. I have. In She's the, one of my local representatives. You're, you're here here in Cobb County. Yeah. W- that being said. What is your assessment of the, the, the Democratic race and the Democratic opportunity um, that's there in 2018? Um, I think that you're going to pick up some, some seats both in the House and the Senate, Democrats are. I, I mean, I, it's just changing too much. In the uh, general election, I can't tell you yet because, you know, a lot of time it's who's running against you. and. <clears throat> Uh, people will vote against folks a lot sooner than they'll vote for them. <laughs> and so I've got to see what the uh, lineup is, really. But I think Georgia, whether it's 18, 22, or 26, they're going, I think you could elect a statewide officer this year. Okay. I think whether it's 18, 22, or 26, you're going to elect a governor. Brian Robinson. Mm-hmm. Um, Nathan Deal's communications man, uh, he he is he surmised that Democrats will elect a statewide official uh, much sooner than they will overtaking a majority in in the general assembly. I uh, disagree. As long as you, unless the Supreme Court were to say that you can't have political gerrymandering, right? That's true. There's no question about that. Uh, but I think with the litigation that is going on. I think there's going to be more and more litigation. And this is the, the just for posterity's sake, the, the Wisconsin. Wisconsin, and, yeah. and there's also one in North Carolina. There's one, there's one in North Carolina that's being tried right now. Mm-hmm. They started mm-hmm. about two weeks ago. And I think that I think that one of those cases is going to hold that there's a First Amendment. Mm-hmm. Uh, because uh, when you segregate and pack, that there's not a, a way for a dissenting view to, to be uh, expressed. I think there is going to be a tough, uh, I think it's going to be tougher to gerrymand. Now, there, uh, let me just say this. There are no saints in redistricting. I was not a saint. They're not a saint. Uh, but looking at it now backwards, uh, since I'm out of politics, uh, one of the things that's wrong with Washington uh, is the gerrymandering of congressional districts, and I think it's one of the dangers here in Georgia. Jay Morgan, who who is executive director of the Republican I Party, know Jay went, very well. Went, went, I'm very when, good friends. With him. When Bobby Kahn was executive yeah. of, of the Democrats, he said that he agreed that a, a sort of nonpartisan independent redistricting commission at the state level or at the national level in the the various states, that would do wonders, but it's not going to happen. It's just an academic exercise because unless, as you say, the Supreme Court forces it. No, I don't think self-preservation will allow it to happen (laughs) unless it's forced by the courts. Uh, It's kind of like integration. Integration would never have happened in the South if uh, courts hadn't said that it can. There's There's a mayor's race in Atlanta tomorrow. You're on the record uh, endorsing Vincent Ford, State yeah. Senator Ford. And the reason I did that was because he was one of the great allies and lieutenants I had in the Predatory Lending Act. Mm-hmm. And you know, my the coin of my realm is uh, loyalty. And he stuck with me, I'm gonna stick with him. What do you think about, um, Birmingham just elected a, a new mayor, very progressive, uh, in the in the cut from the same cloth as Bernie Sanders, endorsed by by, by Senator Sanders. That there is the Atlanta politics of sort of the establishment with, with Kasim Reed and Governor Deal have worked very closely. Yeah, I think there's uh, something to that. I think Atlanta has been a little uh, first place. African Americans were allowed at the table 
in Atlanta much sooner than they were in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> and so uh, I think that that has kind of slowed uh, the you know, uh, process down. There's still a lot of influence in the business community here. There's no question. What does the the, the composition of a, of the Democratic Party of Georgia, it, it, its priorities, what do those look like in 10 or 20 years from now? Well, I can tell you what they should look like. Sure. Uh, they should be based, uh, we have a long way to go in education. If I were running for governor this year, I would be saying, uh, any person that wanted to learn a high skill or a medium skill, you know, uh, welding or, or whatever, there's a free education for you. Because the greatest shortage we have is skilled workers. So I think it needs to be based on that. I think that affordable housing is going to become one of the critical issues in the next 10 years because housing is being priced out so much in this this right. area. I think environmental concerns, that is leaving us enough open space, is going to be. So if they are smart, they will latch on to those things. Um, and, you know, one of the faults of Georgia Republicans is if you can hire a lobbyist, uh, that you can get yourself a tax break. Now, in the old coalition days, we didn't raise taxes. But we ever nobody got a special break. It was rare that a bill ever came out of Ways and Means with Marcus Collins. I mean, it was just rare, some type of tax break. And I think fairness in taxes are going to become a, a bigger issue too. Do you think there's? Do you think the state will will embrace sort of a a, a comprehensive? Uh, we were talking about transportation. Right now, it's on a very ad hoc. Athens, Clark County, where I live, we're, we're voting on a T splost here, and then there's, you know, mm -hmm. there were the, the over a regional T splost and everything like that. Is that, is that a sustainable way? No, it's not. But what happens is you have to be able to guarantee those regions outside of Atlanta that they're going to get their fair share. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, I mean, listen, when all of this comes down to leadership. This all comes down to giving comfort, to having a leader that gives comfort to everybody that he or she is going to be fair. Well, Governor Barnes, I don't want to keep you. You've got, well, thank got, you. got a bunch of big cases on your well, slate. Well, I got some more appointments here, so, but, but I appreciate it. I've enjoyed I it. really do appreciate it, Governor Barnes.